So I'm really looking forward to this conference and it's a really great pleasure to have um, Kevin from the University of Sydney as our first speaker. And he's going to talk about tensor categories in positive characteristic. So thank you, Kevin. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the organizers uh, for this conference. Okay, it's gonna mean a field. Um, pretty much any field um, is relevant. Um, so I'll start by uh, talking a little bit about uh, what precise definition I use for tensor category, because uh, there's a lot of choice available for that term. And um, there's also many ways to motivate or introduce uh, tensor categories, but it seems appropriate to um, use one of the very original motivations, uh, which is uh, intimately, intimately related to uh, the theory of motives. Um, and really kind of the very um, first probably idea of uh, motive. So probably in this conference, we'll see many more um, further evolved approaches to motives, but this is kind of really uh, connected to the very original idea. So um, I just wanna pick up from the usual story that's uh, motivated by the wall conjectures. Uh, people went from having not enough cohomology theories on varieties to having too many uh, very quickly. Um, so for instance, just rather randomly, if I take a field of uh, characteristic P, I could, for instance, consider et al cohomology or crystalline cohomology on uh, smooth projective varieties. Um, and typically different cohomology theories look rather similar. Um, so a priori you would hope that somehow they come from some initial or uh, some universal cohomology theory um, that takes values in Q and that then extension of scalars gives you all the other cohomology theories. Um, but one can prove that that's actually not possible. So despite looking similar, they don't come from some cohomology theory over Q. Um, so then the idea due to Grotendieck is that um, maybe we should just replace this category of vector spaces by something which looks a bit like the category of vector spaces, but isn't the category of vector spaces. And there's even a, a concrete um, suggestion, namely one can define some category of motives, Chow motives, and, and uh, look at numerical equivalence on it. And then we do get a canonical functor from the category of smooth projective varieties with that. Um, and conjecturally, at the time, and still, I suppose today, um, the cohomology theory is all factored through this universal cohomology theory which takes values in this category of motives. Um, so this category of motives, as I said, it's, it's not vector spaces, but it's somehow close in some sense. And that is in the sense that it is a semi-simple tensor category over Q. Um, in the definition of tensor category that I will use, which uh, is the following. So um, the, a tensor category is a symmetric monoidal k-linear category with some uh, conditions. So let's say a k-linear. Symmetric monoidal category C. Uh, is a tensor category over our base field K if firstly the endomorphisms of the tensor units uh, are just a field and nothing more. Um, the category should be a B unit. And the monoidal category should be rigid, so every object should have a dual. So a monoidal dual. Um, okay, so this is, uh, of course, modeled on the category of finite dimensional vector spaces, uh, not just all vector spaces. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have this last property. Um, okay, so this is the precise definition that I will use. Um, and so, as I said, the category of motives is such a tensor category. I mean, if you define numerical equivalence uh, motives. 
uh, pure motive. And um, it's not just a tensor category because it's supposed to have um, nice functors to categories of vector spaces. So if we add that to the picture, then uh, one arrives at what is usually called a Tanakian category. Uh, so from some point of view, it might feel like a Tanakian category should be defined as a pair of a tensor category with a functor to vector spaces, but usually it's just defined as some uh, tensor category with the property that there is some tensor functor to vector spaces. And by tensor functor, I mean a functor which preserves all the structure that we have. So it's a k-linear exact uh, monoidal, symmetric monoidal functor. Okay. Um, and it's a, a very important property which you can derive from the definitions in a finite time that uh, such functors are automatically faithful. Uh, if you don't believe that, then just add it to the definition. Um, and so we uh, allow a, a field extension of our original base field uh, for this. Um, so the reason it's called Tanakian uh, refers to the ideas of tanaka Klein duality, of how you can recover a compact topological group uh, via the forgetful functor on its representation category. So this principle of Tanakian reconstruction works in this setting too. Um, so let's assume that the two fields are actually equal, uh, which we can always assume if K is algebraically closed, by which I mean, if K is algebraically closed and there is some tensor functor to an extension of the base fields, then there is actually a tensor functor to the original field as well. Um, so in that case, um, if you have such a functor, then the category is automatically equivalent to some representation category of an affine group scheme, which you can recover as the automorphism group um, of the tensor functor F to vector spaces. Um, so it's just not just a group, it's really an affine group scheme, which as a group functor, you can recover by uh, looking at uh, the original functor composed with extension of scalars for every K algebra and uh, construct a group functor that way. Okay, so if the field uh, wouldn't be the same, then you would get something slightly more complicated uh, representations of um, an, um, of a group part acting on spec of large K or equivalently quasi coherent sheaves on the corresponding uh, stack, if you prefer. Um, but I'll, I'll mainly keep this idea uh, in mind. Okay. Um, so there's of course many examples that you cook up, can cook up of Tanakian categories. Um, basically anything that smells enough of representation theory and is a tensor category will be Tanakian. Uh, so if you take a, a topological group and look at continuous representations over R or something that will give you some Tanakian tensor category. Uh, so this principle tells you that there's actually also an affine group scheme that corresponds to it. Um, or you could take maybe representations of some Lie algebra, and you can again quickly see that this is a Tanakian category. So there's going to be some affine group scheme with the same representation theory, and of course, its Lie algebra will be much bigger than the original one. I don't, don't know if there's much motivation to uh, investigate that. Um, but so, in the spirit of this conference, also I want to focus on uh, examples which are. Uh, slightly less straightforward. Uh, so I want to look at uh, hidden representation theory, even though by now it's, it's not very well hidden anymore. Um, but they're still very nice examples. So um, I started from the, the category of motives. So if we restrict to zero dimensional uh, motives, so motives from uh, zero dimensional varieties or Hital algebras, um, then we get some nice 
so a simple Tanakhian category, which is constructed out of etal algebras. And so it should be governed by some group. And obviously that will have to be the, the Galois group of the, the absolute Galois group. Um, so you get continuous representations over Q of the Galois group. Um, so just to give kind of a um, basic example of this idea that some tensor category, even though you do not construct it in the representation theoretic way, uh, might be some uh, representation category of, of a group. And uh, in a similar vein, if we take some nice enough topological space X and look at the category of locally constant sheaves on that, then we get a tensor category. And if you choose a point on X and look at the stocks, it gives you a tensor functor to vector spaces, which allows you to view it as a representation category of some group. And that is of course then the fundamental group of the point that you chose. Um, and final example is, uh, I wanna give is a geometric Sataki equivalence. Um, so very roughly speaking, um, it's possible to construct a category of uh, um, perverse sheaves on affine Grassmannian corresponding to a reductive group. And if you work hard enough, you can show that the cohomology is exact and the tensor functor. Um, and so there must be some group that has that category as representation category, which turns out to be the Langlands dual of the original uh, group you started from. Uh, so this is uh, Mirkovic Filonen uh, geometric Sartaki. Um, okay, so three examples of uh, where representation categories appear uh, via different constructions of tensor categories. Um, so that kind of motivates the question, um, is it possible to tell intrinsically when a tensor category is Tanakian? So as we've seen, if you already have the functor to vector spaces, then you can recover uh, the fact that it's Tanakian, but can we say it intrinsically if somehow we forgot the forgetful functor? Um, so in characteristic zero, uh, very uh, um, explicit answers to those questions were uh, given by Delini. So if my field K is of characteristic zero, then the category is Tanakian, if and only if for every object in the category, um, there is some integer such that the corresponding exterior power of X is zero. So since we have a, a symmetric braiding, I can define an exterior power in any tensor category. And clearly if the category is Tanakian, then this is satisfied, but the opposite uh, apparently is also true. So this is sufficient to conclude at least in characteristic zero that the category is Tanakian. Um, and then you can go further um, because the first example of a tensor category which isn't Tanakian would be the category of super vector spaces. Um, so Z2 graded vector spaces where the symmetric uh, braiding uh, has this typical causal minus sign um, or um, closely related, uh, you often encounter the category of Z-graded vector spaces with this causal sign rule as well. Um, so they would be examples of tensor categories which are not Tanakian uh, for the very simple reason that because of the minus sign, this is no longer true. We can have objects where uh, it's the symmetric power that is uh, zero at some point or uh, neither is zero. Um, but it's also to, uh, and then you can of course arrive at supergroups, which are uh, affine group super schemes. Um, so just building uh, schemes on super commutative algebras. Uh, so then a tensor category turns out to be super tanakian if and only if for every object, um, there is some number, let's say R such that, um, if I look at the length of successive tensor powers 
of x um, in the abelian category, then this is bounded by the corresponding exponential function. So this is nowadays usually referred to as saying that C is of moderate growth. So again, one direction of uh, this theorem is straightforward. You just take the overall dimension of the vector space X on which the supergroup acts. And then clearly the length will be bounded by the dimension. But the other direction again is uh, not at all straightforward. Sorry, Kevin. Um, yeah. So the Lin's theorem says that um, if that condition is satisfied, you can find some um, fiber functor that's also defined over K or some extension, or finite extension, or what is the condition? Um, so it's a priori just over some extension. Um, and then if you work harder, you can show that the extension is finite if your tensor category is small enough. So in particular, if the field is algebraically closed, you can take uh, the original field. And then if you believe in like transfinite induction, you can prove that you don't need this condition that your tensor category is small enough. Uh, so that's pretty much how it goes. So and, you can uh, always take a finite extension, yeah. Is there any uniqueness claim? That, that... Yes, yeah. Um, for this, you need algebraically closed fields, and then uh, it is essentially unique, yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's, of course, important for this extension from small enough tensor categories to all tensor categories. Once you have uniqueness, you can paste things together in, in a kind of typical sense. Yeah, so, um, I mean, based on Masood's question, it, it, it also follows uh, for algebraically closed fields in a fine group scheme, the term is a tensor category and the tensor category uh, determines that a fine group scheme in return uh, uniquely because there's only one uh, possible fiber functor. So in characteristic zero, Tanakian categories and affine Sorry, for algebraically closed fields, Tanakian categories and affine group schemes are kind of uh, in, in, well, let's say bijection to say it very crudely, but you can cook up the appropriate equivalence uh, of categories. Okay. Uh, and to conclude this list of uh, theorems, right, uh, Lini, um, I should say that not every tensor category is of moderate growth or equivalently. Um, Super Tanakian. So you can construct tensor categories where somehow this uh, length of the successive tensor powers explodes uh, quicker than any exponential. So this kind of gives a very neat um, explicit structure theory of tensor categories over fields of characteristic zero. Um, and so it's interesting to note that all the statements that I said um, make sense also if your field is of positive characteristic. Um, over positive characteristic, it's still clear that Tanakian implies this and super Tanakian implies this. Um, and it's a priori maybe not clear that the reverse should no longer be true. Um, but it does turn out that uh, the opposite direction is no longer true. And counterexamples have been known for uh, quite a long time. Uh, so in the 90s, um, there were a bunch of counterexamples constructed by Georgiev and uh, Mathieu and Gelfand and Kajdan. Uh, so I'm going to give like the, the base case of that, which is uh, treated explicitly uh, more recently by Ostrich. Um, because it turns out to be the most interesting case in some sense. So the, the general idea was to take uh, a representation category of uh, a reductive group and somehow cut away certain things, which you can do in positive characteristic and you still end up with a tensor category, which is no longer Tanakian. Um, but you can make that very explicit in kind of the base case. So we start from 
representation category of the cyclic group of order P, P the characteristic of the field. And we take the semi-simplification, which is another way of saying we quotient out the unique maximal tensor ideal of this category and really quotient it out in a, in a, in a naive way. Um, so um, again, because of the theme of the conference, um, the category of numerical motives that I mentioned at the beginning would be the semi-simplification of uh, the category that I would get if I take rational equivalence. So that's another example of semi-simplification. Um, and here you could actually also take a rep of alpha p, it would have the same semi-simplification or uh, tilting modules for SL2. They all give you the same semi-simplification. Um, okay, so if you do this, then you get some semi-simple tensor category and uh, we can see what it is. Um, so it turns out for P equals two, this is just the category of vector spaces. Um, for P equals three, this is the category of super vector spaces. So certainly in those characteristics, we have done nothing new. This is as Tanakin or super Tanakin as it gets. Um, but things start to become interesting uh, from, uh, so, in the chat, someone asked what alpha p is. Uh, I mean, the Frobenius kernel of the additive group. Um, so the, yeah, I don't know if that's sufficient as an explanation. So it's, it's an infinitesimal group scheme, uh, which you construct as the Frobenius kernel of the additive group. Um, in characteristic five, things become more interesting because I claim that in, so this is uh, known as the universal for Linda category. Uh, in verb five, uh, there is an X such that if you tensor it with itself, you get the tensor unit plus X. Um, so this is not something you have to take just uh, because I say it. it, it corresponds to the three dimensional representation of uh, C5. Uh, so in characteristic five representations of C5 in decomposable ones are labeled by their dimension. And it's just so that if we take the tensor product of this three dimensional representation with itself, it's skew symmetric power is again M3 and its symmetric power is of dimension six is the trivial one plus the projective one. And that's how you get your six dimensions. But of course, this becomes zero in the semi-simplification because its uh, categorical dimension is zero. So that's how you end up here. And this is, of course, interesting because if X were a vector space or a super vector space for that matter, um, then its dimension would have to be the golden ratio, which seems implausible. Uh, so this is an example which contradicts um, the naive analog of the linear theorems in positive characteristic, because it's clearly of sub-exponential growth. I mean, already rep C P would be of sub-exponential growth and we've just thrown away things. So it's uh, certainly still of sub-exponential growth, of, of moderate growth. Um, and then there's this very beautiful theorem uh, about five or six years old now uh, by Ostrich, um, which is that every symmetric fusion category, which it in this context means a semi-simple tensor category with finitely many simple objects, um, admits a tensor functor to for P. Hence the name universal for Linda category. Um, so why is this uh, so interesting? Because if we were to do the same thing in uh, characteristic zero, then and ask if there is some fusion category such that all other uh, fusion categories have a tensor functor to it, then the answer would be yes, the category of super vector spaces. Um, so 
in characteristic zero, looking at fusion categories kind of predicts in some sense the Linnaeus uh, big theorem that any reasonable tensor category admits a tensor functor to super vector spaces. So based on this at the time, uh, Ostrich conjectured that uh, the Linnaeus theorem remained true if we replace super vector spaces by the Verlinde category. So his conjecture was that any tensor category of moderate growth in characteristic P admits a tensor functor to Verlinde category, which means that it would be the representation category of some affine group scheme in this Verlinde category. Um, so unfortunately, uh, there's a very um, simple-minded counterexample. Uh, if I look in characteristic two, and I look at the chorus, uh, this Hopf algebra of dual numbers where X is primitive. So if I would uh, use the uh, kind of obvious symmetric baiting, I would get a uh, rep of alpha two. So this is uh, alpha P for um, P equals two, but I can take a slightly more interesting braiding where the flip is given by the ordinary one plus the action of X. Uh, so you can check that also this gives a symmetric uh, tensor category. And then a very easy calculation again shows you that the symmetric uh, power of H, I think I went with just S in the other part, uh, is of dimension two. So again, this cannot have now a symmetric tensor functor to uh, to vector spaces because um, a two-dimensional vector space, I mean, would have to have a three-dimensional uh, second symmetric power. So dimension is not very categorical, but the point is that um, it, it, it also has length too, and every simple object is the tensor unit. So obviously this has to be preserved by any tensor functor. Um, so, uh, this clearly doesn't admit a tensor functor to vector spaces. Uh, and the reason that it fails to do so is that it is not Frobenius exact. So I should say a couple of things about uh, Frobenius exact tensor categories. Um, so a, Frobeni uh, a tensor category is Frobenius exact if one of the following uh, conditions holds, and they're all equivalent. So the kind of uh, most simple-minded one, maybe also least instructive, is that for any monomorphism of my tensor unit into an object, uh, I want this morphism, which I obtain by taking the piece power of the original morphism and projecting onto the symmetric power, uh, should be non-zero. Um, more uh, explanatory of why it's called for being is exact is um, equivalent condition is that the following functor should be exact. So I take any object and I map it to the image of the canonical morphism of the divided power into the symmetric power. So from uh, invariance under the action of the symmetric group to co-invariance. So that's one way of defining the Frobenius twist of a representation of an affine group scheme in characteristic P, uh, which you can apply to any tensor category and still show that this gives you an additive functor and twisted K linear, uh, twisted with the Frobenius homomorphism. But a priori, it's not clear that it should be exact. So we can impose that it is exact and then say that that is how we define Frobenius exact tensor categories. Um, so I think I'm running out of time, so I should probably just say this very quickly. Uh, we can also just look at um, symmetric algebras of objects with infiltration and either first take the graded uh, objects or first take the symmetric powers and um, then we get a, always a surjection, which is saying that taking co-invariance is a priori only right exact, or saying that this is um, a deformation of the symmetric algebra of the graded object, but not a priori uh, a flat one. Uh, but if this is an isomorphism, that's an equivalent condition. 
Uh, and finally, we can take the full p power of an object and not just regard it as an object in C, but an object with an action of the symmetric group, but also we can restrict to uh, a cyclic group of order p. Uh, and then apply this semi simplification to get to the Valinda category. So this is a process which is not a priori exact, but if this whole thing is exact, that is also an equivalent condition. Okay, so they're all things um, which might be exact or non-zero or an isomorphism, but it's not clear that they are for any uh, tensor category. And so we've just seen an example of where it's not because uh, this is basically a violation of this formulation here. <clears throat> okay, so uh, one can think of this as follows. So clearly any semi-simple tensor category is for being is exact because all the exactness things will be obviously true because any additive function is exact. Um, but more generally, if you have a tensor category that has a tensor functor to a semi-simple category, then it must also be for being is exact because tensor functors are faithful and exact. So they, uh, if something in the image is exact, it must have been exact to start with. Um, so uh, Frobenius is exact tensor categories include all of these. So if we think of the spirit of the Linnaeus theorem where like categories admit tensor functors to these very nice semi-simple categories, then if we want such things, we must automatically restrict to Frobenius exact tensor categories. <clears throat> um, and so at this point, I should uh, say that, so we've seen an example of something which is not for being as exact in characteristic two. It took a while to prove that there exist examples in other characteristics, but Benson, Eating of an Ostrich proved that um, there are non for being as exact tensor categories in every characteristic. <clears throat> um, which also means that the, the very original conjecture by Ostrich is uh, false for this reason in every characteristic. Uh, but as we see, the, the spirit of the conjecture was, uh, was bang on. Um, because recently we managed to prove uh, the following theorem with the uh, hitting of an Ostrich, which says that if we only look at Frobenius exact tensor categories, uh, then the following are equivalent. So there is a tensor functor to the Valinda category. So for which we obviously need Frobenius exactness by the above. Um, and as Ostrich's conjecture predicted, uh, C is of moderate growth. Um, but quite fascinating is that you can yet equivalently impose that for every object in your category, there is some natural number so that the corresponding exterior power vanishes. Uh, if you define it correctly, if you define this as the image of the skew symmetrizer. So in positive characteristic, you can define um, the exterior power in many non-equivalent ways as an invariant or a co-invariant or as this image of the skew symmetrizer. And they're all the same in characteristic zero and they're all the same for vector spaces. But already for super vector spaces in characteristic P, uh, they're different because this definition, if you apply it to a super vector space will eventually give zero uh, for high enough D, which kind of more classical definitions as invariants or co-invariants uh, uh, would not do. Okay, um, so this is uh, uh, quite uh, remarkable in the sense that in characteristic, in characteristic zero, this singles out super Tanakian categories and this singles out Tanakian categories. And in positive characteristic Z, uh, they become the same condition and they single out what you could call for Linda Tanakian categories. <clears throat> 
Um, okay. Um, maybe I'll skip. Well, I'll, I'll say a couple of words about the proof. Um, no, I think I'll skip the proof. Um, and talk about applications instead. Because I um, started the talk by uh, saying, this is kind of a natural question to ask. Uh, so let's see that now that we have some kind of uh, answer to, to these type of questions, um, how we can actually use it uh, to kind of recognize now, uh, for instance, Tanakian categories uh, that are not a priori obviously Tanakian. Um, so an interesting example is if we take some finite group um, G and look at its representation category over a field of characteristic two, uh, then obviously it's an Akian, but we can take it some simplification um, and try to say something about that because, well, I mean, we know this is a pretty complicated category. We might as well uh, semi simplify and see if we can say something about that first. Um, so this is again, clearly of moderate growth as already explained. Um, and if we do this over a field of characteristic two, then we've seen the Vlinder category is the same as the category of vector spaces. So this is Tanakian. So this um, turns out to be representation category of some affine group scheme H. Um, so, um, one of the reasons uh, that we're interested in this example is that uh, Dave Benson has uh, quite intriguing conjectures about um, uh, odd dimensional representations of uh, two groups in characteristic two. Um, so, I mean, the idea is that support theory will tell you nothing about indecomposable representations. Uh, whose dimension is not divisible by the prime. But those are precisely the ones which appear in this semi-simplification. Um, so uh, Benson has these very concrete conjectures saying stuff like, if I take an odd dimensional representation in decomposable, multiply with this dual, I get a copy of the tensor unit of the, of the trivial representation and all other indecomposables have to be even dimensional for some magical reason, uh, without much theoretical uh, reason, but with huge computations backing it up. Um, so if we just take his conjectures for granted, then it actually gives a rather concrete description of what this H should be. Um, so just these conjectures about certain specific things about two groups, tell us that for any group uh, G, this corresponding affine group scheme, uh, must be of this form. So it fits into a short exact sequence um, such that it uh, projects onto the normalizer of the, of a Silov two subgroup divided by the Silov subgroup. And A is some um, possibly usually infinitely generated uh, abelian group uh, without a torsion. And we take its Cart Cartier dual, which gives us a diagonalizable group scheme. And uh, so those very specific conjectures give us this rather uh, general description of uh, what this H should look like. Okay. Uh, so the fact that H is of this form is in fact equivalent to Benson's conjectures. Um, okay. So in a similar spirit, we could start from a finite group. I mean, here you could take any affine group scheme, but already a finite group, it's quite interesting. Um, and look at its representations of our field of characteristic P. Um, then for any 
uh, representation, you could uh, assign the following value. Uh, so let's uh, break it down. Um, first, let's say that for any module D, uh, M, I call D of M the number of uh, indecomposable direct summons. Uh, which are of dimension not divisible by P. Uh, so let's say maybe M alpha. So basically what proportion of M is uh, not divisible by P. So again, with the same motivation as um, saying something about the tensor product, which is orthogonal to what support theory uh, could teach you. Um, so this just calculates what proportion is uh, of dimension not divisible by P. And uh, then we could look at what happens in the limit. If I take uh, bigger and bigger tensor powers of M, and of course I renormalize because you expect something exponential there to uh, hope to get uh, some real number. Um, so if you uh, assign this invariant, a priori it looks like maybe you could get any kind of number. And it, it's very difficult to prove, I think, directly that this is somehow well behaved with respect to tensor products and uh, direct sum, et cetera. Um, but using uh, the main theorem, you can actually prove that this delta gives you a ring homomorphism and on a rather small ring. Um, so it's a ring homomorphism from the, the Grothendi group, but the split Grothendi group. Um, so you shouldn't expect this to be well behaved with respect to short exact sequences because it's all about indecomposable direct summons of certain dimensions. Um, but if I take the split Grothendi group, um, I get or Grotnik ring, I get a ring homomorphism uh, to just Z where I have to adjoin uh, twice the cosine of pi over P. Um, so to give an example for P equal to two or three, this is just Z. So for some reason, this um, value assigned to any M has to be an integer for P equals to two or three. It's um, something you might find interesting or not, but it seems very difficult to prove it without this um, theorem uh, about the Verlinde category. And so maybe I should conclude with one example where uh, the first example, not surprisingly, uh, if you remember what the Verlinde category was in uh, for P equals two and three, that it is interesting is P equals five, in which case this is um, the ring generated by the golden ratio. Um, so remember that the second tensor power of M3 with itself uh, had this form in rep C5. So if you believe the fact that this is somehow a ring homomorphism, um, it means that delta must satisfy this relation here and must therefore uh, be the gold ratio itself. So you see that um, Uh, you do get uh, these values that are not integers as soon as characteristic is uh, five. Okay, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, so are there questions for Kevin? Kevin, yeah. so this this P, um, the Linda category, is its growth in D group just the this cyclotomic thing or this real cyclotomic thing? Uh, almost. Um, it's um, so, I mean, you, you can see for uh, P equals three that it's not quite that because for P equals three it will be super vector spaces and you would get two copies of set. Um, but that's, except for that, you're right. Um, so this for Linda category, uh, you can write it in this form. I mean, for P at least uh, three and so this is kind of an 
half of Rp, and that has precisely uh, this as a as a Grothendieck ring. Um, so there's there's some information hidden in the braiding somehow, just like super vector spaces. Uh, they look like vector spaces, but the braiding kind of makes a difference. Kevin, when was it first observed that the Frobenius, like, so you have this definition of the Frobenius twist trunk, there is image of divided powers in um, symmetric powers. And when was it first observed that this is not necessarily exact? I mean, I somehow realized that this functor could be relevant and then uh, wondered whether it was exact. And then I saw this example of that I called rep age. Mm -hmm. um, so that for me personally was when I realized it. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I mean, this example was, I mean, this is a, a rather classical example, which is supposed to appear in Morava K theory. Um, but I suppose the idea of Frobenius functors on tensor categories is quite recent. Uh, so, I mean, when Ostrich made it, made his conjecture, he wasn't aware of this example, because otherwise he wouldn't have uh, made his conjecture. So it's quite recently that this was observed, I, I think. It's kind of interesting, because I remember people telling me ver various times about this functor, but um, the fact that it might not be exact was kind of, I don't think was was realized. Yeah, it's certainly something from the last four or five years. Okay, so it doesn't seem like there's any more questions for Kevin, so thank you very much for this beautiful talk. And 